by the way, if, if you look at the last, well, I fully agree with these three conclusions. Um, if you looked at the last one, you say that the combination of scientific and ecological um, things are needed. And I would say yes, but I want to add things which are necessary as well. And let me say that uh, ethical and legal and perhaps even political sciences. And I try to do that. Um, I'm very happy with your presentation and with all the examples you gave for several reasons. I think that many of the examples uh, are relevant for the things I want to present to you. Uh, second one is, which I am also happy with, is that you see that sometimes uh, situations and harm and so on can be restored, at least more or less. Yeah? It's not always hopeless. Yeah, I, I saw that from your examples. Um, but of course you need to manage and to, um, in a correct way, in an ethically, economically sound way, and we need science for that, but we need more things and I'm going to talk about that. Now, I am very happy to be here, and I'm happy that you are here and willing to come to listen to, uh, to this topic. So, um, let's start. But this is not, uh, well, this is an important part of my uh, presentation, but I do not want to start with that. Um, okay, not with that on the side. Um, that's my topic. Um, also, having listened to the presentation of Mr. Mancini, which was also very important and interesting, um, he talked about bio-risk and that in fact there is an entire spectrum of bio-risk starting even with natural phenomena yeah, uh, up to unintentional harm that you are talking mainly about or only about uh, to biosecurity things which are intentionally uh, caused. Um, and the last thing, topic is very extremely important and, and that's also reason that it's very good that you are here uh, because uh, we cannot be, be satisfied, we cannot think that things will have been arranged correctly, that we as biologists can just continue doing our work and that uh, others will take care of. That's not the case. That's, it's, perhaps really the opposite and that's one of the reasons that unfortunately you are involved and it's good that you're here. But I as well as you want to, to talk I think more, not only but more, about uh, risks that are primarily unintentional. So um, I would say bio risks, well there is, they are related, I mean they are not, uh, you cannot uh, distinguish them. Uh, me, coming from ethics, I would say that my main concern is about man-made risks. Yeah? And, and those include the, let's say, the unintentional ones that you were talking about and the intentional things that uh, Mr. Mancini was talking about. Um, in the end, they are all man-created and my attitude, at least today, of biosecurity risks would be that, um, okay, the one who creates a dangerous substance, dangerous things, um, accepts with that uh, a certain responsibility for, for whatever may happen with that. And that, I would think, includes that other people uh, steal it from you and do all kinds of nasty things with it. So that I would say there is a relation and also there is a continuity. Now, so now I come from ethics and um, at least later I started as a scientist as you may have seen. Um, so there are indeed I think there are a few ethical principles that are directly re relevant for the topic that we are talking about and I'm going to present them to you. They are much broader 
than just biology, or even they are much broader than just risk, but they are very relevant. And I'm going to talk about that and about the implications. This is the overview. A few words about risk governance, just to it's good to have a definition for that, so I can use that. Then the two ethical principles and their uh, implications. Then you see something about politics. So am I going to talk about politics? Well, yes and no. I'm going to talk about the procedures that politicians use to take their decisions. And there is much to say about that. Um, and I'm going to talk about legal liability. Because those ethical principles combined with the procedures that police politicians use lead to certain desirabilities in liability law. As, as my specific example, I will present to you a uh, European directive, so a European piece of legislation on environmental liability. And perhaps you have not heard about it, perhaps you have. So perhaps you in the back you may have heard of the uh, European Directive of Environmental Liability. Who has? Who had? I think it's very relevant for many of your examples. It's a... Uh, okay, and if it's not yet what it could be or should be, it can be developed into that, providing there is the political will, yes. Um, but you know, you need effective and efficient management uh, and you need science for that, but I think you also need law and not only, but including liability law. So that is what I'm going to talk about. Also a few things about uh, regulation, which comes uh, up front, yeah. Um, not very much, I think in general we cannot be very happy. Regulation should be much better than it is. Um, how come that it's not better than it is usually? There is an explanation, but okay, the explanation is not only enough, we should change things. That's difficult enough. And I will end with a few words about the uh, responsibility of, uh, of you. So risk governance, that's the totality. Institution includes law as well, hard law, soft law, soft principles, as Mr. Mancini mentioned. Um, the totality uh, of yeah, whatever we have to control, to contain uh, risks. Um, so this is a very big and very broad thing because everything is in there. Um, I, am, I am really convinced, I will try to show you why, that we need to improve our system of risk governance. That's my deep conviction. I try to explain what could be improved and what should be improved. But as I said, I start with ethical principles that are relevant for that. And there are two. And this is the first one. Actually, the claim about these two ethical principles is that together they are necessary and actually all also sufficient for living peacefully together as people. They are also necessary for progress, I think. These are, um, although they are formulated in ordinary words, I think you can look at them as something like mathematical theorems. You know, there are assumptions going into them, you have a conclusion, namely that they are necessary for that, and you have a very precise argument and the assumptions are quite sound. So this is this one, I think you know this one in, in some way or another. That's very often it's called the no harm principle. So people are free whatever they want to do, but they are not allowed to harm others. Um, that's an active formulation, so to speak. You can also formulate it uh, <coughs> passively, and then it says that everyone has the right to be safeguarded from negative consequences of other person's actions. Now, here comes the difficult point, namely that if you talk about, so I'm doing something, and you experience consequences of that. 
Now, are those consequences negative? Well, I mean for you. Or not? Or they may be positive, yes. Um, there are, some things are quite clear. I mean, if I kill you, then most likely it will be negative uh, for all us. But it's not always clear. And, and that means that basically, there are subjective elements in the notion of negative consequences. Yeah? It's you, the person who is subjected to the activity, who should decide whether it's negative or positive. This is very basic, yes, but I think it's unavoidable. And, and it, it follows also if you are going to talk about risk. Yeah? Risk is something there's, there's a possibility of a negative effect, but you don't know how big the possibility is and so on. And again, the estimates of, of the, the probability, for instance, and, and the consequences even, is at least in part subjective. Yeah? So it's unavoidable, but it follows, and, and that's why many people find this very difficult, at least uh, emotionally or psychologically that uh, our basis for our behavior towards others should in fact always be informed consent. And that's a difficult one, as I already said. Because linking up to what I'm going to say in a moment about political decisions, very often they are being taken with, at best, a majority. Which does not guarantee informed consent for, all, for everyone. So this is the first one, but you actually, many people, perhaps most people will say, no, this is not enough, this would suffice if everybody would live up to this principle, but if you are realistic enough to assume that there will be situations that people will not live up to that one, then you need a second one, otherwise you cannot do anything, you cannot respond. Yeah? Because it's, it's forbidden by this principle. So that's why uh, many people, accepting absolute pacifists, I would say, yeah, who exist, but I'm not one of them, and perhaps you're not either, you need a second one that could be something like this. So that's called here the reciprocity principle. And uh, it says that if you violate the right of another, so in this case we talk about the no harm principle, so I violate that right and do you harm, then you acquire the right to take counter actions uh, with a goal, and that's the only goal that is legitimate according to this principle, to restore your harm, or if that's not possible, to get compensation, and at best, to prevent future uh, repetition. Yeah? This is the basic ethical framework that uh, I in fact worked from. Um, and you could say of this framework that, that many people, and, and I suppose you recognize it, because I think that uh, in the minds of many people, whether they are Western or non-Western, I think that is not, not really a difference uh, here. Many people would consider these, indeed, very good principles. And if you look at law and legal systems, then you see that uh, many laws that we have are yeah, based on, on these two principles. Point is that in cruci on crucial points, I say they are not fully, but they do not fully implement these principles, um, and and what they do not uh, is essential in our evolving technological, globalizing, and so on world. That's basic thing. Uh, what is it? Yeah, because so it follows from both things that. Uh, If you engage in an activity, whatever it is, and it creates a possible harm, a possible risk for another, and you do not have the informed consent of the other, 
then there should be liability. You should be liable for if a certain negative effect uh, materialized. And except this, this principle is not or only partially, uh, very often only very partially, implemented in our current legal systems. And, and as I see it, this is one of the things that we should do in the future if we want to have a sustainable, green and so on uh, society, then we should change this. So, to repeat more or less, why uh, liability? For activities that others had not consented to, of course. Um, basically, two reasons. Um, it's ethically fair. It would be unfair if I uh, would be confronted with negative consequences, whereas I was not the actor and not even consented to that. But the second one, which is equally important, and, and where comes the link, I think, with the examples that you presented, uh, is that uh, I think it's really needed for effective risk governance. Yeah? Otherwise, there is no incentive for really uh, uh, for governance of risk or environmental pollution or whatever um, that would be, let's say, socially desirable, but it will not come, come about because it's not the optimal thing to do for the actors. Yeah? I think again, here is a, um, a thing on the, uh, on the screen, uh, the last um, sentence, which has the character of a uh, mathematical theorem, or a mathematical uh, yeah, theorem, yes. Again, as long as we have this situation, you can say with certainty that in our world, um, more risk-generating activities come into being than is desirable from the perspective of the totality of people. Yeah? And I already, I think, already said that uh, the fact, the, the very simple fact that we take political decisions at best based on majorities, that is within countries, but the um, activities that we uh, legalize by that kind of decisions, of course, have impact across the uh, borders. So it's in, actually it's very often a very small minority that takes those decisions. So if that's the situation, then we should, our national and international legal systems should be based on full liability, which is not. That is what I say there. So, if we look at what is the actual situation in the areas that we are interested in, then um, very often liability is only conditional, limited, and, and very often indeed it is totally lacking. What is conditional? Um, that means that certain conditions need to be satisfied before I can hold a party liable for some harm. Condition can be, be uh, a very important one, that as long as you can prove that you were not uh, abnormally careless, for instance, in your activity, then you are exempted from liability. So if a plant loses a dangerous substance, but they can make a case that it was, they were careful, but for some reason or other, it did escape and there was harm, but they are not to be held liable. That, that's an example, and a very important one. And uh, of course there are also um, many uh, limits in the law with which limit uh, <coughs> compensation or, or liability uh, below the actual levels actually. So that's another example. And the entire phenomenon that's, yeah, I think you don't realize that, but all 
our companies, private companies, are limited liability companies and from my perspective we should immediately get rid of those things. So one of your examples was the BP spill and I think that the, the liability claims to BP were in the order of what BP could maximally bear. It's a big company so it's billions of dollars. Um, but it shows that if the disaster would have been twice or ten times as big, then there should have there would be the problem. Yeah. Um, so actually, we can't have that. I have examples, but we have seen already many examples. This was this is one from the Netherlands, and, and uh, like yours, it's 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 chemical. It's not directly biological, but these are just examples to, to think about the, uh, the 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 problem in itself. So it was a fire in, in a chemical plant uh, with, with a big cloud, uh, poisonous cloud. Um, um, damages, direct damages from contaminated soil nearby and contaminated water was estimated to a hundred million uh, euros. And then you see the interest, which I find interesting here, that uh, the company couldn't pay because it was bankrupt by that time, yeah, could not pay for any external damage. There was an insurance policy which went up to 15 million guilders, uh, euros, and which is not abnormal, which is the rule. So there is the rule, not just at the Netherlands, but in Europe and, and, and abroad, um, is that if you have a company engaging in potentially da dangerous activities, then it's the rule that you are at best underinsured. I find it quite unbelievable um, that people are willing, are tolerating that these kind of things are continuing. So it's not the case that after this event, and this has been in all the newspapers in the Netherlands, that uh, a big majority of voters or politicians said we immediately need to change these laws. We need to have a law that uh, requires uh, sufficient uh, insurance to any company that wants to do these things. Doesn't happen. Okay, as long as that doesn't happen, we cannot, we can hope for a sustainable world, but we will not uh, arrive at that. So, this was what I wanted to say uh, in here. And of course, it's about chemical uh, poisonous substances, but it could have been a biological substance. It's tangible, so to speak. Probabilities are very hard to assess. Uh, consequences may be bigger as well. Um, but what you see is that, um, for that reason, there is no insurance company in the world who is willing to insure risks for GMOs escaping from their fields or whatever. No one. Um, why? Well, they say because it's not insurable. Because it's so difficult for them to assess the risk and the probability. What would you do with such a reaction? Okay. Insurers say, okay, they're not going to... These risks are not insurable. So, we do not want to insure them. And then the government say, okay, they say what they what said here. What would, how would you respond to this? Why should I respond? I simply go and teach in my field and don't take the risks. No, you, but you're a citizen now, so. Uh, but as a citizen, not as a company. Uh, um, what would you expect from your government to respond? Not much better. But I think it's difficult. Okay. <laughs> we would expect better policies about uh, these issues. So, what I personally, as a, let's say as a citizen, I, my idea is in fact that governments should impose um, requirements for uh, insurability and for insurance, 
And then see what happens. If then still no company says, okay, but this is, no, no, too dangerous for us. We are not going, you can say we can earn money of this, no, it's much too dangerous. Then I would say, okay, but should we then really engage in that activity if it's so dangerous that nobody wants to ensure it? So, as a citizen, I'm very unhappy with this situation. This is not, not just for DMOs, I mean, this is a, a, um, there's a long tradition here in uh, attitudes of governments towards uh, insurance requirements for technological activities. Started with uh, nuclear energy, where there is something, yeah, but where you had a similar discussion, now you have it in DMOs. I will very briefly on this because we have already seen so many examples. Um, so this is one more. This was in Spain, so it was a mine. Uh, a dam broke, a uh, spill of toxins into a natural uh, area. And then um, apparently um, the uh, miner, the operator, was forced to, uh, to compensate, to take compensating measures by creating or restoring uh, natural area uh, along the shores of that uh, uh, polluted uh, river. And so that happened. Oh, okay, fine. I, I say this because um, because, and, and now I come to that uh, European uh, piece of law on uh, environmental liability. That law could have been, it was not used because it was it's very recent, but that could have been used indeed by the government, because that's a restriction, to impose liability on operators. Um, it's, it's not, let's not, let's not think that um, it's all European, because actually their methods were taken from the second one, uh, which is American, and which was started after the Exxon Valdez, where they have tried to do similar things. Because in the US there is some legislation about liability and compensation, and uh, Exxon paid heavily after this disaster. But then you need to calculate, uh, okay, what is uh, sufficient compensation and so on, and there you have a combination of uh, economy and uh, uh, biology, let's say. Yeah. So I find this uh, very interesting. Uh, why? Well, because, uh, well, for two reasons. Um, it's the polluter pays, of course, yeah? So he, she, who created the harm is required to uh, restore it as much as possible. But also, as a managing principle, as I said, if you want to uh, effectively manage and, and want to take precautions where they are needed, then you need to have these uh, also financial incentives. Otherwise, it won't, uh, won't work. Um, there are, so that European directive is fine, and there are similar things uh, in development in, in the United States, as I said. It is not sufficient at this moment, but it can grow. Um, there are a few shortcomings. Uh, first one, uh, only uh, authorities can uh, start a case. And you would say, okay, but we have very good government. Well, I'm not, I am not totally convinced, but you know, Again, then you would you have the situation that um, a majority um, in government can decide either or not to start a case. Whereas, because of the things I said, it should be possible for anyone to start a case, a minority included. Um, perhaps even more important are two other things which are under point two. And, and the first one is that you uh, governments can also exempt uh, parties, companies, whatever, from liability if they had a permit. But that's not the, the right way uh, to uh, proceed. Again, of course, you can have a majority or, or whatever to, uh, to give that permit, and we don't, we don't look for that, we don't want that. 
Uh, second one, which is also very, this is a very deep one, very fundamental one, and I ask your attention for that one. Um, this you see often in European and American uh, legislation about technology and developing technology. Uh, for instance, in products liability, you see that same thing, and it says that uh, you are so someone who introduces a product, but it can be a GMO, whatever, yeah, into the market um, cannot be held liable if at the state of knowledge at that point you could not positively foresee that there would be that and that risk. Yeah? And I think we cannot have such a kind of exemption. We cannot have. But I leave it to you, it's a very deep issue. I know there has been a very fierce discussion, well, political, um, within different, between different interest groups about 10, 20 years ago when this was uh, first uh, created in, uh, in Europe, these kind of things. Um, I think the good answer lost and so there is work to do there. Um, what I want to say more? Yeah, that, that's a very deep one. I cannot help thinking that um, so I have pointed to things that I think are very fundamental flaws in our legal systems and which we cannot have in our technologically developing, globalizing society. And so it's interesting to look at their sources. And they are relatively recent, I think. They stem from the, uh, the 19th century, from the time of the Industrial Revolution. Um, before that, and in, in Europe and in other areas of the world, uh, these kinds of um, liability flaws were not tolerated, were not accepted. Very interesting to see that. Um, so this is just an example. If you want to read more, then you can go to a paper, which I will mention in the end. But just a few examples. But you, you know that the, um, one of the things that uh, happened was that uh, a shift from what I call here risk liability, what people usually call risk liability. So a person who creates a risk is responsible for it, also in the sense of liable, to um, something which is more fault liability and which leads to all kinds of exemptions. So this is the source. Very interesting why. Okay, this, these are the reasons that I can come up with uh, why these changes we see which are now very unhappy, I think, in our, our world. How they came about? There were citizens in the newly uh, born, it was getting late, uh, about ex ante regulation. I think we will need always ex ante regulation that, that holds for things like biosecurity that Mancini talked about, uh, but it holds generally. Um, liability cannot do everything. If only because many things are not reversible, yeah. So you cannot uh, restore them, and hence perhaps not compensate them. Um, it's very difficult to uh, arrive at a really effective ex ante regulation, and I think this is why um, there are again two principles. This is related to what I said before, but in a different way. To have what is now commonly called precautionary principle. This is one formulation of it. And it says that if you want to engage in an activity which may cause harm for another one, um, then the burden of proving that there will be no harm or that it will be acceptable, also for others, is the deal. Um, and of course, uh, if you uh, nevertheless continue, then you're liable. That's, that's clear. But this is the precautionary principle. Whereas, if you look at our actual practice, then you will be able to see that very often we work on a very different and opposed principle, which is there. 
uh, an activity that uh, is potentially harmful can usually can only be stopped when some party, presumably those who are opposed, succeed in coming with positive, conclusive scientific evidence that there is a risk. But you will see, as, as scientists, uh, you know that there is an enormous difference between these two things and that it makes a crucial difference uh, who has the burden of proof for something. Because it may be very difficult to give a scientific proof that there is a certain specific risk, very often, very look at cases like uh, lung cancer cancer and the relation with uh, smoking. Um, you have a lot of statistics, I would say, but still it was very difficult to come up with positive proof. Um, so it makes an enormous difference who has the burden of proof. In our society, the burden of proof is with those who fear uh, negative effects. And I think if you want to have sustainable and so on, society, then we should go back to the other principle. I think this is what I uh, wanted to say and want to end on, uh, yes, you, you have a responsibility, unfortunately, I mean, you're a scientist, I suppose that, uh, well, it's very good that you're here today, so you're interested, but your main interest, uh, I assume, is in science, so biology. It's unfortunate that you're here and that you have to be here because you cannot assume that uh, the, the totality of, of, of uh, yeah, institutions, laws and so on surrounding you uh, will see to it that your work is being uh, used in a positive way. You don't have the guarantee and that's why you have to be involved also here. So the first thing is you have to be aware. Um, I think also being a scientist, you are committed to the second uh, bullet there, which means that you need to be always critical, not merely in your own work, in your scientific work, but also when it comes to the uh, social issues that we talk, to about, uh, talk about today. You have a responsibility there as well and yeah, okay, the last one, I, I, I just want to mention it because I think I have to mention it. I think it is not, it is not um, um, self-evident that it is harmless, just harmless, to develop any, sign, any, any knowledge that you can or want. I don't think so and I think that you can derive that from even from scientific norms that there may be uh, uh, points <coughs> where it is actually against scientific norms to continue developing certain areas of knowledge under the current circumstances yeah the social legal and so on so and that's not very fortunate that's not a very nice uh, message but i think uh, it's true and that's why i want to say it well, I thank you very much for your uh, attention and for listening so long for me. And I hope there were some things that you didn't know yet that I said.